So thank you very much, Andy, for, for coming. Um, he's from MD Anderson Cancer Center, and he's going to talk about uh, the genomic medicine capabilities there. Uh, well, thanks very much for giving me the opportunity to, to fly up and, and give you a brief overview of, of what we're building. Um, and I think building is the key word um, at MD Anderson, since certainly since my arrival back last April and with um, the arrival of, of Linda Chen as well. Um, I was telling somebody it took as long to get from the shuttle over here to this to the Hyatt as it did to fly from Houston to Dallas. So I spent about as much time on the ground as I did in the air. Um, this slide is actually supposed to be slight um, um, depict the problems we are trying to sort out. All the houses look alike: um, high altitude to low altitude views, building big pipes, and at the end we'll talk a bit about branching and and how things are related to each other in a in a, in a heterogeneity evolutionary sense. Um, you've all seen this slide or variations on this theme multiple times, but I, I'll put it up one more time. Um, you can call it personalized stratified precision um, ad nauseum terms, but essentially it all comes down to the same sort of continuum we'd like to work on, um, in particular in terms of speaking mostly about cancer, the right target, um, identifying through various uh, forms of patient omics, basically the genomics at this point, large scale efforts in terms of Cancer Genome um, Atlas Project and the International Cancer Genome Consortium, but taking that sort of retrospective um, cataloging data, validating that in current patient populations, and identifying things that look like targets, identifying what be my mechanisms of action, and then moving those into um, various uh, appropriate drug development, assay development, and biological assays to at least come up with agents that can hit the target we think we've identified by virtue of mining omics data, and then of course, the hard things begin to happen where we have to develop the ability to find the right patients. Um, lots of what we're finding in genomics tends to be clusters uh, of relatively rare mutations across different tumor types for any given gene. Um, the, the BRAFs and the P53s and the RASs um, are, are quite uncommon, it turns out, and that makes life more difficult to even start on this process, let alone get there to the end. So we began to think about what needs to be done, at least in terms of a single institution, to try to um, advance or, or accelerate this process. And one of the ideas that's been put together at MD Anderson is the so-called Moonshot Program. And this is moving from a paradigm of what is essentially clinical expertise, um, which is very tumor-centric, um, one could argue siloed to a certain extent, and trying to leverage that expertise across tumor types, across commonalities, but doing that in such a way that you now leverage the expertise across multiple departments and also building an infrastructure that allows the generation of, of the deep data sets that one might begin to need to put yourself on that, that upward turning arrow. Um, the focus is, is on patient impact, um, deliverable driven, sort of as opposed to a more academic research environment where everything generates new questions and you can chase things endlessly down rabbit holes. Um, comprehensive in that it's attempt anyway to span the whole cancer tear continuum from looking things like early diagnosis, um, prevention, all the way out to issues of, of the, the sequelae after a cancer diagnosis and treatment in terms of survivorship. I think the key component, which I'll try to highlight here, um, is the collaborative internal and external and the organizational constructs and technology that need to be put into place. Again, fabulous clinical research, but not much in the way of cross-cutting translational research um, on a very large scale. Um, one of the key things um, that we've tried to do in terms of thinking about how you build genomic medicine capability was to basically try to not tackle every single thing at one time. So not these selected cancer types, which are triple negative, high-grade serous leukemia, um, of, of several flavors, lung, melanoma, and prostate. Instead, what we did was specifically to go after a subset, at least to try to build the system to prove and work out the structures and the kinks and the systems that had to be put together to try to d leverage large-scale data generation in both the clinical and genomic um, arena, put those two things together and try to move things forward. As I said, one of the key components of the moonshot is not just the idea we want to um, reduce cancer mortality. We all want to do that. Um, one of the key components is a serious thought and investment given to what sorts of infrastructure need to be developed to empower that activity, both within a tumor type and across tumor types. And what's been put together, and many of which are actually ongoing and being built, are the so-called platforms. Now, platforms are, are somewhat akin to cores, but not quite the same thing. And I could be at pains up here for the rest of the afternoon trying to tease out the difference. But essentially, what we're talking about 
are research enterprises which are, are run almost on a, a semi-industrial scale with a professionalized staff which are not subject to the academic sort of um, um, evaluation structures that are in place for most cores which are run as a part-time enterprise by an academic faculty member. And so they're, they're on a, on a deliverable-based industrial scale. Um, they're subject to you know, contract renewal on a yearly basis depending on performance. So the ones being put together won't surprise you too much. Um, the Center for Co-Clinical Trials is essentially trying to leverage large-scale um, model organism development for the cancer types, um, primarily the focus of the moonshots, and to build that into a system where patient samples are being explored in both xenograft animal models, genetically engineered mouse models of the, of the most pertinent cancer types are being developed, and essentially being run in parallel in terms of, of looking for new drug development, looking in terms of genomic markers at the same time as, as the human cancers are being um, analyzed from the patients. A freestanding institute for personalized cancer therapy will also be leveraged. This is run by Gordon Mills and John Mendelson, which is already doing um, sort of targeted genetic testing um, on the back, back of clinical trials to try to identify new indications for therapy in patients um, who have failed the primary treatment, looking for things like you know, the usual suspects, EGR, EGFR mutations, RAS mutations, and the like. There's platforms being built around cancer control, early diagnosis, um, primarily focusing a lot on proteomics with the recruitment of Sam Hanash. Um, clinical genomics um, needs a, a, a major sort of um, retooling um, and scaling uh, to be able to handle um, the workflow we see coming. That's underway. Um, Jim Allison has arrived and is working on building a platform, if you will, that will take into account and begin to have a systematic um, deep dive into the immunological parameters of each patient and each patient's tumor. Um, the Institute for Applied Cancer Sciences is essentially an academic drug development unit, which is now encompassed within um, MD Anderson. So the ability to go after targets that may not be the, the, at the first um, order of, of intention for large-scale pharma, but may um, be driven by smaller efforts in more boutique or esoteric sort of target space. The translational research continuum is a fancy word for basically saying you want to try to merge this, um, the clinical genomics, and all in, in, into as close a ties and interaction with the phase one and two units at MD Anderson as possible. And last but not least, the last three things here are what I'm going to concentrate the rest of my, my talk on are building research genomics and informatics, thinking about um, leveraging big data, and I'll tell you what I mean by that, and molding this into a framework that we've come to call um, adaptive learning. So the little man's head's been cut off, which is a bit unfortunate, but anyway, he's really sick. So you have, I mean, the overall gestalt and, and flow is given here. It's, it's reasonably complicated, so I'll take a few minutes to go through it. Um, we're putting in place the normal things you might think we'd want to do. Um, one of the first ones that's, that's, that's um, almost at the cusp of being put forward or, or approved um, is a universal consent which allows the collection and generation of, of omics data. At this point, primarily focused on genomics data. It doesn't specify the uses of those data. Those data would have to come as different IRB-driven protocols, which say, this data has been generated on this set of patients. I will now want to access that data for a specific study. So you slightly shift the paradigm in that you don't have to write a study each time you want to do genomics and study it. You have to write a use case and a use-driven IRB protocol to study the, the universally collected genomic data, at least on a subset of the moonshot tumors at this point. And of course, one needs the consent in place, but also more regularized and, and ordered and SOP-driven biospecimen collection banking and, and indeed biomolecule processing preparation of analytes. Um, all of these things have been put into place and are modeled somewhat and driven by the experiences and we've, we've had both in terms of, of the ICGC experience and the TCGA experiences. So we, we're beginning to know how to do some of these things a bit better. Um, what you have down this side is the research data, and this comes from all of those platforms that I just showed you. So all those platforms, other than probably the IPCT, are operating in research space in terms of generating proteomic marker data, genomic data, um, immunological um, monitoring data. All of these data will be come out of this box, and on the opposite side you have the clinical information and tests. This is essentially all the information that's collected on a patient from entry um, through treatment, through um, um, follow-up that resides in any clinical database within the institution. And currently, I think that number is about 26 or 27 separate databases. 
So ideally, one doesn't want 26 or 27 different databases. What actually one wants is to merge all of this and all of this into an integrated patient data warehouse. The actual, that, that simple notion of having your research data and your clinical data living in the same database space such that it becomes much more track, tractable to query it, to write analytics over it, and also to regulate access in terms of making everything, again, a use layer such that everybody's running analyses inside the framework rather than downloading data onto laptops, onto USB sticks, walking around with patient data. Um, this is the model anyway. Now, I can say this and it's easy to say in a sentence, but we all know that the, the road to big data warehouses and merging clinical and genomic um, data sets is sort of that road is littered with the burned out husks of thousands of cars. Um, <laughs> We think we have a way forward. Um, you can invite me back at some time in the future and I can tell you where we were burned out car or not, but I'll, I'll give you the model of what we're putting in place at the moment. This was actually already ongoing before we arrived at MD Anderson in terms of, of trying to merge the clinical databases um, in a staged process over a, a, a multi-year process into a centralized data warehouse. So we sort of leveraged on that capability and the backbone that was already there, basically an Oracle type backbone, and began to have serious conversations with providers about how we actually move genomic data and omics data into this same warehouse and what the sort of the relational structure of that database should be. And that's sort of literally the conversations that are happening almost on a, on a daily, if not um, um, other, every other day um, basis. What we'd also like, obviously, is to pull in external data. We'd like the TCG, ICGC data in there, the PubMed, all the other data that one might think would be useful in terms of understanding the collective experience um, from, a, from a, a, a published standpoint or a research um, enterprise standpoint for any given patient that you see walking in the door who may share characteristics but of another patient that you have collected in the database. And on top of this, obviously, one of the things that attracts um, um, certain facets of the institutional um, um, hierarchy is the ability to um, improve efficiency of operations. Um, it's a big hospital. Every, every efficiency saves money. Saving money is good. One can envision how one might having your radiology data and your pathology data integrated may, save, may have cost savings in terms of recapitulating these databases. Individual informatics personnel supporting all these siloed databases now are integrated into supporting a much larger data structure. I think one key facet and something we're working on quite hard is how do you leverage all of this in terms of learning about each individual patient and moving from what has essentially been a, a, almost a frequentist type model where you collect a thousand patients, then you go back and ask questions about, okay, where were they similar, where were they different, where were there facets that may have pinged upon the differences in those patients, to actually moving to what is arguably almost, almost a Bayesian sort of approach where each patient becomes almost a research um, um, participant and moving forward in terms of integrating both their clinical data and research genomics data and essentially moving into an era where each patient becomes a model for at least overlapping phenotype and learning about that phenotype for the next patient who, who enters the study. And again, this is an iterative cycle. Not all this whole thing swirls in a whirl relatively rapidly, hopefully, and that we're learning from each patient um, and eventually informing better treatment decisions, integrating this data so each time around the circle, one hopefully does an, 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 uh, an incrementally better job at least identifying what the key issues are and hopefully actioning and impacting those key issues. So big data. Um, it is Texas after all, so it couldn't be anything else. Um, Again, this was already being built, the longitudinal patient data warehouse. So the key facet here is this isn't snapshot data anymore. This is data over the living history of a patient as they're seen through the process at MD Anderson in terms of um, all the way through the process, every follow-up data. We're very much interested in the longitudinal aspect where a lot of what's been collected in terms of at least genomic data has been very much snapshot driven. So the challenge is there in how do you, how do you obtain samples longitudinally? Um, it's no surprise that we started with leukemia because that's the easy pl easiest place to get at the samples longitudinally. Solid tumors present a huge challenge, which we're getting to think about. But inside the massive data analytics box, for lack of a better term, um, all sorts of things can be envisioned. Um, clinical decision support, operational efficiency um, gains, learning where the systems, learning how to compact, um, particularly the IT support for a lot of the independent databases and individual sort of um, clinic databases and, and mechanisms that are in place. And again, research and development. 
One of the key facets and one of the things we're trying to put forward first is this notion of, of end-user end interfaces um, with the understandable and hopefully, or at least understandable data. We'll move on to actionable later. One of the key things we've engaged with first is the ability to make sure that one of the first things that gets stood up from all this sort of genomic data and integrated patient data is an interface that a physician, uh, a clinician who's actually seen that set of patients that they helped enroll can actually go back now and query that database and begin to extract information without having to have a bioinformatician on the payroll, without necessarily having to know how to code, or having a clinical, clinical fellow spend the next three weeks digging through um, individual patient records. And I think this is critically important because it builds support within the clinical community at MD Anderson. And I think it's incredibly important, again, allows them to begin to use the data to see what the history of their patients is and begin to see things that may, maybe they haven't appreciated before and contribute and become partners in the research process rather than sort of, um, 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 sort of passive participants. And again, also a, a layer for researchers. And again, the hardcore bioinformaticians would of course be able to go in and, and, and work on the, the raw data themselves. But this is the order of importance in terms of, of, of Im implementing any of this is actually to get something out for the clinicians um, in the first instance. So the Leukemia Project. Um, I'll give you a couple of slides on exactly what it, what it is and what the plan is. So the plan is to take the next 1,000 leukemia patients who essentially, quote, walk in the door um, with a, a pretty decent focus, it has to be said, on reaching for MDS, AML, and CLL because these are the moonshot tumors um, focused on but not limited to newly diagnosed patients. We started enrolling at the end of September, and I think as of about a week ago, there were 250 patients enrolled. And again, fairly heavy in the MDS AML, CLL just coming online, but also with a decent number of, of, of acute lymphoblastic leukemias as well. Samples are taken at diagnosis um, or presentation in terms of previously diagnosed or, 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 or referral patients. And thereafter, at each patient visit along the normal clinical path of, of referrals and patients coming back in for evaluation. We're taking saliva and buckle for the normal, depending on the leukemia type, bone marrow and or peripheral blood for the tumor sample. And again, the key here is bone marrow and blood are assessed in the context of the normal clinical work being care. That is, the saliva and the bone marrow being collected in the bone marrow clinic. Everything remains in a CLIA compliant chain of custody. The research samples are split from that and taken out. But the, the loop is essentially closed in that we don't have to resample the patient per se if we actually want to move back into, from the research environment, back into the CLIA sample, which has been held the entire time. So that's a key facet of the design. What we're doing, um, we're generating genomic data. Um, at this point, we're generating um, whole exome sequencing and starting to think about generating um, low-pass whole genome shotgun. The latter gets you rearrangements, um, which in this case are, are quite interesting for at least a subset of, of the AML patients, um, which don't have apparent translocations. Um, this is being generated um, on each pair um, data generated from the normal tumor presentation and from the relapse samples when the patient actually relapses. So 20 to 50 percent of these patients will actually go into relapse over a period of months. That's the next sample. So essentially each patient gets sequenced for three samples up front or at least in the course of the initial sequencing wave, the normal, the tumor, and the relapse. We keep the individual samples from the, 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 the enter sort of relapse space to be able to dive back in and start asking questions about minimum residual disease, early detection in peripheral blood from circulating DNA, and the other things one might want to do. Um, all clinical data are currently collected in the departmental database. Again, leukemia has its own database where they collect every single facet of information that they think is important for leukemia patients. That's being a, a combination of, of automated extraction into the large-scale database and also exploring a lot at the moment um, with natural language processing and crawling through patient records. For instance, cytogenetic data is semi-structured. You can't uh, automatically download it into the database. You actually have to process that data through a natural language processing. And that actually seems, I mean, I've been remarkably impressed, actually. I was, I was highly skeptical of how well it was actually going to work. But for some of the fields where we need the data, it actually seems to be doing a really credible, credible job. One likes to ask, think about the questions one could begin to dive into with the first 250 patients or the first 500. Um, I just list a couple of them here that are, that are interesting. Um, what um, facets are important in the progression of MDS to AML? Um, can we identify patients who are at risk um, for death during induction chemotherapy? 
and, I, and an issue I'll come back to in a few minutes. Um, can we understand more about subclonality of any, any given patient's disease and the propensity to have relapse and progression on standard of care therapy? So that's sort of the leukemia project. Again, we're enrolling patients. The sequencing has just begun, so no data to show you. In fact, this is the most data-free talk I've ever given in my life. Um, <laughs> But there we are. Um, the other opportunities I think we're going to try to really hammer on over the next, uh, the course of 2013, are an issue that I'm quite interested in is this issue of genetic and genomic heterogeneity. Um, moving into an era um, and thinking a lot more than, it, than certainly has been thought about in this notional idea of comprehensive cancer patient genomics. That is really thinking about the, the germline and the somatic genome of the patient as, as, as an integrated, um, interacting um, whole rather than having the more traditional model where, you know, germline genetics is, is the parlance and, and the purview of this group over here. Somatic genetics is done by these sort of geeky sequencing people, and they never actually get together and talk very often. They sort of have embassies in each other's country, but they don't actually visit very often. And I think that's something we need, need to sort out, and I'm, I'm sure everyone in the room is on the same page with that one as well, because there's clearly some interesting things going on, um, not only between the germline and somatic, but also thinking about the other genomes in play in each patient in terms of all the, the little bugs and whatnot that are crawling around uh, over and inside of us. Um, one area as well is to move into the impact of genomic on outcomes, particularly the no notions of survivorship, thinking about long-term issues, um, which I'll go into um, now. Just briefly on the H word, um, heterogeneity, um, it's no doubt that genetic heterogeneity is a key determinant of variation in all the outcomes we care about. What we just like to know is what cancer genes are operative in any given set of tumors. We and others have shown remarkable variety, at least at the somatic mutation level, of all the cancer genes that may be operative in an otherwise homogeneous disease like ER-positive breast cancer, for instance. If we could learn that, we'd like to know what is the level of intratumor heterogeneity within each patient. There's a tremendous amount of work going on now, both from multi-sampling multi of primary tumors, deep dives in whole genome sequencing data, um, leveraging single cell sequencing technologies that are uh, uncovering a pretty bewildering array and, and depth of the intertumoral heterogeneity problem, none of which we actually have nailed down too much how much it actually matters. And I think that's the important question here. Heterogeneity is nice or um, important or interesting, but what impact does it actually have? Does it actually matter in the context of whatever treatment you're giving? Does it matter where the mutations are in that tree structure that we all like to draw? I think the other important facet is what are the germline and somatic sequence variants that are imp impacting the other things that clinically matter a lot, drug metabolism, immune response, um, what role does cancer susceptibility play moving away from the, the highly penetrant Mendelian disorders and perhaps in a middle ground between the population-based risk and the intermediate susceptibility driven by somatic mosaicism and all the other things which seem to appear on um, almost a weekly basis in the journals, and as well thinking about toxicity. And finally, this notion of cancer patient genomics in a comprehensive scale. Um, each patient, of course, is a, is a composite or an interaction of two um, germline, uh, germline um, genome and the somatic genome. And also, as I said, all the other genomes that we're beginning to understand as well. One of the things that's been reasonably well covered is, is risk and response to exposure from a to, to, um, tobacco UV ration, diet stress, but I think these are all areas that are being explored heavily now, trying to think about these, the interaction and the axis between these two things. Two of the ones I think we're going to focus relatively heavily here um, um, down at MD Anderson are treatment um, response, acute toxicity and resistance. This goes hand in hand with doing lots of work in terms of genomics and, and, and target-driven trials, but also thinking about survivorship issues, um, long-term toxicity, particularly interested in late recurrence and relapse, um, and second primary cancers in the context of several diseases, starting working a lot in, in the CLL world now where the patients are at extraordinary risk of developing second malignancies, and thinking about late relapse and recurrence in the context of breast cancer um, and, and other tumor types as well. So this gives you a, a sort of a, a, an overview of what we hope to get up standing up, at least to a certain extent, over the course of, of 2013. And the key people involved in particularly the Leukemia Project, and again, sort of thematic, symbolic sort of gesture here with the bridge between the, 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 the omics, labby type people and the, and the uh, leukemia physicians over here, particularly Hagar Concharjan, um, chair of, of leukemia, um, Guillermo Garcia Monero, Michael Keating and Bill Weirda, um, the people in the molecular diagnostics lab, and all the people on the other side of the bridge 
particularly John Frenzel and Keith Perry on the informatics side, and of course um, in collaboration um, with Linda and, and the team here. So that's, that's sort of what I wanted to tell you and just give you an overview. I'm happy to answer any questions if we have time. Thanks very much. Great. All right, thank you, Andy. Um, so we do have time for questions. I see Gene. Go ahead. Could you get into a, a little more detail on this business of consent? What, exact, what precisely are you getting up front, and what do you do after that? So the, the, what, what we're planning on, and, and again, it's an ongoing discussion with the RIB, is to obtain consent um, on, on a, a universal basis in terms of obtaining samples for analysis and sequencing or omics, and in this case, it's going to be sequencing in the, fir in the first instance, such that there's a step where, and it, and w w it remains to be seen whether we're, we're actually going to be able to move it forward in that exact fashion, but let's take it as written that that'll move forward. And essentially, the data generation, the sample collection data generation sets becomes the norm for, for each patient who gets consented under that protocol. The view then is that creates the data in the warehouse, and then if you want to do a study, then you have to start applying for use protocols. So the notional idea is it, it should empower the whole system in, in that if you decide you want, you're interested in hepatocellular carcinoma, you don't now have to write a protocol to go out and collect, to sequence the hepatocellular carcinomas. Those patients will have already been consented and collected. Again, it remains to be seen whether we're going to be able to stand it up or not. But it's an, a notional idea to move forward and, and think of moving into an era where sample collection, data generation becomes the norm in terms of that research environment, um, thinking about each patient as a research partner, and what you now control are the access to the data, um, sort of use case driven IRB protocols and use case driven access to the data. They're great. Oh. These are very ver vulnerable patients, and I suspect you're going to have uh, some discussions. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, in, in fairness, it is an ongoing, very active discussion. We have Pearl and Jonas. Thanks, very interesting. Um, following up on Jean's question regarding the consent, um, just for the clinical data, if mm -hmm. I come in as a patient, am I asked to consent for my clinical data, let alone exome sequencing, to go into the big center database? Um, not at present. I mean, that, that lives in the departmental databases at, at the moment anyway. That, that's all collected. What we're trying to do is port that into the big data warehouse, but it's an interesting question. Um, does that change the nature of that data now when you integrate it with genomic information? And again, it's a conversation that's happening. I'm not sure how it's going to play out, and I think one can make a case for sort of both sides of the coin, but you have fundamentally now altered the structure or, or, the, or the value or the interactivity of that data by moving it into this big data warehouse context. And it may well be that we have to move to that model on an individual study basis but it's still, I think, what you would still layer on, I, I would like to see in my view, even if you did that, you are still bounded by the, by the use case scenario on the, uh, right. on, on the study-based research side. So you have to come back in with a use protocol, right. even if they've consented to have their clinical data, their genomic data, that necessarily doesn't mean it's, quote, fair game for anyone to come yeah, and get into. I mean, the, the challenge, I think, for all of us going forward is, uh, will it be wonderful to have this Uber consent form? Mm. If you say no, you have to let those people know your stuff's going to be used anyway. So, I mean, it's a, it's a challenge. So, I think Mark had a comment on the data warehouse. Did you want to comment on data warehouse too, Jonas? Yeah. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Yeah. So, I think the, the point to make is that, you know, we're not in uh, new uh, ground here, that uh, a lot of places that uh, have an integrated data warehouse have different classes of data, in particular payer data uh, for systems that uh, have uh, provider-owned health plans that operate under very different data use uh, mm. agreements than the clinical data. You can still keep those all in, uh, in the same data warehouse with um, the same structure, uh, but then uh, use the permissions yep, uh, to, exactly. uh, to allow the access. So I think that um, the, the, the problem, while somewhat different uh, in terms of research versus clinical, has been approached before, and it's a sol soluble problem. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the, one of the, the people we, we've been, who has been brought on as a consultant has a history in the finance industry where they sort of do this layered access all the time. I mean, it's the way they run their business. So I mean, I think there's certainly models in within the healthcare system as well. So, you know, it is, it is been done before. The challenge at Anderson is actually moving all, getting it done, um, which, uh, yes, we'll see. Not Jonas. So my question is about the adaptive learning platform attached mm -hmm. to this big data and the, the, the integrated patient data. How, 
th this is almost like a, a long-term ongoing adaptive clinical trial. So how <coughs> close do you get to call it a clinical trial? And the, the other related question is, how much would you expose these classifiers to external inspection for validation? Um, I mean, the first question is, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to give you any short answers, but it's an ongoing discussion about when, when you move from that sort of almost a research question, can we develop what look like good um, tools for identifying patients at higher risk of, of X or Y or Z outcome, and then how do you validate those? And, you know, the models of, of almost running a, on a clinical trial basis have certainly been put forward. Um, particularly, we're collaborating to a certain extent with, with IBM and their Watson platform as well. So that's the first place, and certainly there, there's been, at least been in, in, interinstitutional sort of um, validation of, of you know, the things that are being put out in terms of what Watson thinks it knows about leukemia, for instance. Um, the ability to vet externally and have um, external advisory boards and, and, and for that sort of process, I think is completely valid. And I think we're just not ready to stand it up and have people come kick, it, kick the tires yet. But I think it's, it's, it's a viable way to go. Um, and the whole adaptive learning platform is, is again, very much like this sort of large-scale large clinical trial where you sort of are now, uh, uh, you don't have to write the protocol. The patients are already there. The data is already there. You, de you design from the data you already have or at least impinge upon that sort of collection of patients which you already know about. So I think it's, it's a challenge to sort of alter the mindset to a certain extent about how you do these things, but also um, how you put the checks and balances and traps and snares in place to make sure it's actually valid in the first instance. I think it's a real, re real important point. Great, thank you. Terry, Other, sorry. did somebody holler? Yeah. Yes. Okay, a question? Jean, please. Um, I'm just curious as you, if you move this into the clinical system, is there certain education or special education that you've had to provide to staff so they can answer the patient questions? I mean, again, something that's being actively thought about. One of the first challenges was, um, and, and it's quite crucial as you can imagine, just picking leukemia in and of itself in terms of that moonshot sort of um, um, project drive, it, was a long, it took a long, long time, a period of months, even with the, 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 sort of the, the clinicians to bring them up to speed on sort of what these concepts were, um, what genomics actually was, um, formalizing that in terms of answering questions in terms of, of what will come up in the patient, I mean, is an active area which is sort of consumed within the platforms to a certain extent, which I'm not particularly, but um, I've been having, uh, talking with Ellen Gritz about various sort of approaches, and, and I think there's a fairly strong program at Anderson that, that hopefully will get on board with thinking about how you develop those materials, but I think, you know, even getting the clinicians up to speed was, was not trivial, and I think, again, that's sort of where we had to start to even get the thing off the ground. Great, uh, Mike. So I'm curious, on the, uh, as a cancer center, um, how do you envision the incidental findings component of the genome uh, being dealt with? Uh, I mean, you've got largely a somatic environment where you can, you know, you're going to throw out those things that, uh, mm -hmm. from the normal side. Uh, or retain them for, as the incidental findings, but they're not going to be just cancer. They could be a wide range of things. Uh, so I'm, it's, I'm it's, curious it's, as to how you think that's going to um, Well, sort. I mean, I, I know before I left the UK, um, it was a subject of, of, of nearly endless agonizing discussion um, and, and highly heated opinions at both extremes where, you know, you have to report everything back or you report nothing back depending on what you talked about. And even, before, even as I was leaving, they were still in the throes of sort of that discussion. In fairness, I haven't been involved in the discussions of it here yet. I think it's an important point, but it really hasn't reared its head too much. I keep sort of poking it with a stick in meetings, um, but I haven't got anybody to really bite or squeal yet. Um, because just coming from, from even at Sanger, where they're doing large-scale population, 10,000 genomes you know, type sequencing, you know, they're finding germline BRC1 mutations and all the other alleles that you would expect in a population sweep, um, and that even what to do with those when they're even pseudo-anonymized or anonymized samples, I think, is a huge issue there. So I, I keep poking it with a stick and bringing it back up, but um, I think it's an issue that has to be dealt with. I mean, again, what is, what, is, there, is there a coherent national policy at this point here? Is there a coherent local policies? <laughs> no, the, I, I expect to see a policy in the near future mm. of those kinds of targets. 
The um, CSER network is, uh, has written actually a summary of the incidental finding policies at all of the CSER sites that's being submitted any day to genetics and medicine. Okay, that would be, I'd, I'd, I'd be brilliant to see that. And, and actually the Garnet network has, uh, has a paper that's now accepted, right? Yeah. Hmm. Okay. okay, that's brilliant. Yeah, we have it sorted. It. Yeah, I, mean, I was mostly curious about just that, the fact that it's so somatically based uh, at a cancer Well, I mean, center. I think we're yeah. moving into an era. I mean, what I tried to highlight there is, I mean, I, we're going to actively engage the germline now, whereas from, you know, in the last 10 years, we've been treating it as a damn nuisance other than something to filter out, you know, to, to find your okay. somatic mutations and putting it in a bucket. I think we need to move away from that because there's, there's rich detail there about sort of phenotype that we need to learn. Yeah. So we're going to be forced into it whether or why. And far beyond cancer. Yeah, absolutely. Other comments? Great. Well, Andrew, thank you very much for coming. We really appreciate it. Good. All right. So our, uh, our next speaker, speaker is uh, Josh Denny, who's going to be describing the Vanderbilt Predict program um, and Emerge PGX.